All right, guys, welcome to day four of the 21 convention 2010. This is it, and it's going to go by faster than you can ever imagine, and we'll be out of here, and we'll see you in a year. So I thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it big time. Our first speaker today is Bill DeSimone. I got it right? Yes. Always screw his name up. Very, very important speaker that I'm very honored to have here. Everything that Mark, Doug, and Drew have talked about is going to be further intensified and amplified by Bill in a very interesting way. And the Bill is basically, I think, in my opinion, the world's leader in biomechanics as it relates to exercise. What he's going to talk to you about today, no one else is talking about. Hence, Doug really hyped this guy up with good reason. He wrote a book also called Moment Arm Exercise. Excellent book that I highly recommend. I have a copy myself. It's in my backpack. I need to get it signed. Awesome book. And he has a new one coming out that will also be really, really good. So here from New Jersey, Bill DeSimone, thank you for coming. Thank you, man. Yep. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, j just to be clear, though, I have no academic background in biomechanics. So I'm not a surgeon, not a physical therapist, not an exercise physiologist. I'm a trainer. I've been training myself since 1970. I've been training clients since 1983. Uh, I've been certified by NSCA and ACE a few times. Uh, but, but around 1998, I ruptured my own biceps and triceps training, and that led me to biomechanics books. So for the last dozen years or so, I've been working on taking the biomechanics material and relating it to what we do in a workout. So this is what I hope we get out of, out of today, basically why the biomechanics matter, as opposed to just wailing away on yourself in the course of a workout. Um, um, first, though, let me, let me just show you some of the stuff I learned from before the biomechanics. All right, this is Muscular Development Magazine, 1973. First magazine I bought off the newsstand. First article I read in it talked about a Pennsylvania man found dead in his basement on his bench press. He obviously missed the lift, hit his chest, the ball rolled onto his throat, choked him to death. All right, well, welcome to weight training. So later on when I talk about rare catastrophic injuries, that's the type of thing I'm talking about. This was a trade, one of the first trade paperbacks on exercise. And if you note the uh, groovy mustache and the exquisite form displayed in the squat exercise. So that's the kind of the caliber of instruction that was out there. Then of course, please tell me you know who this is, okay? All right, thank you, thank you. I, I did this at an NSCA conference once and people had no idea who this was. Uh, this was, you know, the, the, the uh, what muscle and fitness came from, muscle builder power. And um, as you can tell from the picture on the right, mind-blowing calves. The calves are certainly the first thing that jump out at you in that picture, right? All right. And then one of his contemporaries, please tell me you know who this is. Okay, thank you. Again, I did this at an NSCA conference once. It was, guy, it was you know, chiropractors and therapists, and they said, oh, what happened to his skin? And I'm like, this night, it's, you know, the, the, uh, the Eric Banna Hulk movie had just come out. I said, are you serious? So that, that was Lou Ferrigno, 25 years apart. And he still looks pretty close, aside from the green, he still looks like in that kind of shape today. The other thing we had, you had the magazines on the newsstand, and then you had the, the courses that they would sell in the back of the magazines. So this was like a comic book. It had a staple in it. And it was just folded over. And you know, that's not the printing, that's not font, that's typewriting. Because if you ran your finger across it, it would smudge. So th this was Frank Zane, um, another guy in pretty good shape still today. And near and dear to hit guys, this is Mike Menser uh, from 76 and a little bit later. In the, the area of exercise, he had, he, he had his own niche at the end, but his real, his real role was to kind of bridge the bodybuilders with Arthur Jones. So Jones wasn't really bodybuilding minded, but he developed Nautilus and MedEx machines. The, uh, on the right is the original Nautilus machine from Deland, Florida. And then this is some of the mainstream stuff that came out 
uh, education of a bodybuilder and three more reps. And uh, if you notice in the top, this is, this is uh, from a George Butler book on Arnold. And if you notice above his head in the reflection, it says Mensur is coming. Because at the time, <coughs> even, though, even though Arnold obviously went on to much bigger things and Mensur didn't, at the time, Arnold thought Mensur was his top competition, not only in the sport, but in terms of his appeal to the general public. So that's why the Mensur is coming sign on top of the mirror. Now one thing about this material, the, the, body, the bodybuilding material at the time, there was absolutely no biomechanics in it whatsoever. I mean, it, it wasn't even wrong, it was so far off. It might have reflected what they actually did, so it wasn't quite fiction, but the rationale behind it was somewhere between wishful thinking and magic. But it was, it is very, it was very inspiring at the time, so this is the best shape I could get in around 1996. Notice the intact biceps and triceps. This was after rupturing the biceps. Notice the divot, uh, well, very sub subtly indicated by the fluorescent green circle. And the left tricep is, is intact. The right side, there's no medial head. So the the head of the tricep closest to my body is, is pretty much gone at this point. So, <clears throat> so in between those two pictures, I, I had ruptured my own biceps and triceps. And um, when I looked into the injury, what came out of the, 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 not the muscle material, but the medical material, is that that was a very common injury for people who are 60 years old, for males around 60 years old. But I was 40 at the time. So my conclusion was the only thing I had done to accelerate the wear and tear on my shoulders was weight training in general, but specifically using a really extreme range of motion. So um, when they healed and I went back to working out, I noticed that in some exercises, I lost no strength whatsoever. I could bench press, I could chin up, I could do a standing curl with the same weight, same intensity as before, some exercises I couldn't even get into position. I would try to do a concentration curl, I would try to do a one-arm triceps, and I couldn't even, my arm would be shaking all over the place. I had no control over it. So I put all the exercise books aside and robbed a physical therapist friend of mine's biomechanics textbooks. So these are the, the academic um, definitions of biomechanics. For, for, for me, I look at it as looking at how the bones and muscles of the spine handle load, how the shapes and connections at your joints uh, affect movement, and how the muscles apply and resist force through the limbs. But in the context of working out over a lifetime, you know, in fairness to the bodybuilding material, if you take it at face value, the point of that stuff was to, to train for a, a photo shoot or for a contest. It was never intended to be something you did for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So uh, 35 years or so ago, as the mainstream population became more interested in exercise, the bodybuilders were the ones who knew the way around a weight room. So everyone tried to train like a bodybuilder. And now obviously if you're an executive or a homemaker or a student athlete, that level of, of time and effort and discomfort is completely inappropriate. So, you know, we called it personal training, but the idea came up of tailoring the, the exercise program to the person uh, or, or what the person needed the exercise program for. And nowadays they call that functional training. So even though functional training as a whole has kind of gone off the rails a little bit, as has personal training, the idea of training for a purpose, not just, not just spending hours in the gym, um, did, did, took, 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 you know, took hold. <clears throat> so this leads to our first, our first question. Just a quick show of hands here. Who thinks a barbell squat is more functional than a leg press? Who, who are the barbell squat fans? Oh, so what do we got here? So about half, so I guess everybody else thinks the leg press is more functional? 
on the side. Get out of here. Quick, 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 a quick snap judgment. Which is more functional, squat or bench press? Uh, uh, leg press. Go ahead. Well, that's a good question. Which is a better exercise? Well, it's okay. It's okay because that's. I'm not going to answer that. We're just going to explore it. Okay. So. Um, what, what does functional mean? That's a good question. And that, right now, in the exercise arena, defining functional tra training is, is an issue. Because it's used so broadly, it's used so broadly, it covers body weight exercises, apparatus, vibration machines, cable machines, that kettlebells, that you're right, it's become almost, almost meaningless. But, but in raw terms, function is relating to its purpose, relating to its design. Um, really quickly, I played rugby back in college, and for us, functional was what was going to help us play our sport better and be better at it. And for us, the big two were always uh, squats, clean and jerks. Like, we preached those, and I mean, we were probably wrong, I'm guessing, but I'm looking forward to the exploration of it. But that's what functional meant for our purposes. Okay, f f fair enough. So here we go. All right, so. We're going to look at the, the bones and muscles involved here, okay? So we're going, to start, we're going to start the midsection with the pelvis and work our way down. So <clears throat> pelvis is obviously fairly solid and thick, right? Uh, uh, one immovable joint, but it's a solid block of bone. On top of femurs, strongest bones in the body, right? Thick, strong beams, which are on top of more beams, the tibia and the fibula. Okay, which form with, with the feet form a tripod. Okay, so you have basically below the knee you have a tripod, you have the two shin bones plus the foot. Above the knee you have the long beam of the femur resting on top of a solid block of bone, the pelvis. And when we look at the muscles involved in moving those bones, you've got the glutes connecting the pelvis to the femur, right, obviously a big muscle. We've got three, three hamstrings, a decent sized muscle con connecting the pelvis to the lower leg. And then another big set of muscles, the quads, connecting pelvis and the femur to the lower leg. So below the waist, we've got big bones, big muscles, few, relatively few attachments pulling in few directions, basically straighten the hip and straighten the knee. All right, now we're going to look above the waist. So we have three sections of vertebrae. You have the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. Five lumbar vertebrae, OK? These are the biggest, thickest vertebrae at the bottom of your spine. And they interlock so they, they don't rotate or bend to the side well. And the function of that stability and of that size is to support all the weight above it. Sitting on top of the, the, the lumbar are the thoracic. <clears throat> and if you look carefully, you can see that the, lower, the, most, the lowermost bones of the thoracic, the ones just on top of the lumbar, are bigger. And as you move towards the head, the bones get, get smaller. All right? That's because as you move towards the head, it's supporting less and less of a load. Also, notice the, the processes sticking out the back of the thoracic, the, 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 literally the spines. They're sticking out because the thoracic isn't as locked together as the lumbar. The thoracic is designed to rotate, and those spines basically stop the rotation after about five degrees each or so. The, um, now, not, not shown here is the cervical vertebrae, okay? But as you might guess, they're, they're smaller than the thoracic and have less restrictions on rotation because, again, they're only supporting the weight of the head. So if we're just looking at the bones, bigger bones on the bottom, a descending load at the top, you're looking at a pyramid. You're looking at a structure that's designed to support less weight as you move towards the top. 
All right, so <clears throat> now starting from the bones, we're going to work our way out muscle-wise. The deepest la la layer connecting the spine are the rotators, which connect each vertebrae to the next horizontally. And each one is very short, as is the, the next layer above that, the multifidus, which connects each vertebrae diagonally to the one above it. So, so this is the shortest, the multifidus is slightly longer, but the, the short length suggests their function is to hold together, hold statically, not to twist the spine, which would, which would go with the thoracic, you do need to be able to twist because the ribs are attached to the thoracic. So you do need more general mobility up, up around the ribs. But the lumbar has to support the weight of your upper body. The next layers up, semispinalis and erectus spinae, they're a little bit longer, more superficial. Semispinalis connects the thoracic to the points above it. Erectus spinae connects the lumbar and lower thoracic with the points above that. Um, So now the, the most superficial muscles, which are longer, do account for more of the range of motion around the spine. All right, so let's get back to the original question here. Below the waist, big bones, big muscles, few attachments, few directions. Above the waist, many bones in a pyramid structure Many small muscles, okay, so you have, you have basically a mobile pyramid. What happens when you put a barbell on top of your shoulders? What happens to that pyramid structure? Nobody, nobody would design a tabletop with a pyramid base and put the tabletop on top of the pyramid. If your structure is designed to, to support less load towards the top, you wouldn't do that and then be shocked when the, when the tabletop, when it didn't work. Okay. The leg press, on the other hand, has you move big weight with the big bones and big muscles of your body. Um, also with the squat, now to a degree your back muscles will get stronger as, 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 if you train with the barbell on your back. All right. But don't forget, there's also discs in between the vertebrae, and there are nerves coming through there. So you're, by adding, as, as, your leg, hips and, as your hips and legs get stronger, and you're adding more weight to that bar, you're loading the spine in a, a bunch of different ways, not just muscularly. Are you with me so far? Do you see, do you see where I'm going with this? Somehow, barbell squats in the, in the muscle media are considered more functional than a leg press. But the question is, functional for what? If you're, if you're a power lifter and you have to squat, if that's your, your competition, yes, you have to squat. You have to use a barbell squat because it's very specific. But if you're an athlete and you're trying to train the muscles of your lower body, the, the, the bar on the shoulders completely inverts the function of the spine. Questions? Complaints? <laughs> yes, sir? What if you're training for a vertical jump? Is this, is this still more functional to use a leg press? Whether you're training for a vertical jump, rugby, MMA, your spine is your spine, right? So, you know, a, ver a vertical jump, you're, you're, think about what's happening here. The muscles of your spine are just supporting, descent, you know, descending weight as it moves up. So, <coughs> matching a barbell squat with that particular sport, again, you, you've inverted the, de the demands, you, you've inverted what the body has to do. Um, I realize what I'm saying goes completely counter to Sports, conduct, sports coaching, muscle media, what have you. Okay, but your spine is your spine, I mean, regardless of your sport. Um, so, as far as a barbell squat goes, okay, some of the negatives would be the strain on the back muscles and the discs 
of the, of the actual spine. A regular squat, getting, getting, to what you, you, getting to the point you make though is, without the barbell, the squatting motion does, is more functional. Um, your spine muscles can support the lighter load at the top of the head. Um, the, um, let me get here. Mechanically, the, bar, the sticking point of a barbell squat happens at about the joint angle for peak torque for your glutes and your quads. So I'll explain more about peak, tor peak torque in a minute, but it does vary the resistance appropriately, a regular freehand squat. Um, so the issue becomes, how do you make it more challenging with, with a freehand squat? Now some, some other joint issues with the squat. We'll, we'll go into the squat a little bit more. If you notice, if you squat down too low, your, 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 the curve in your lower back flattens out. Even though the spine is curved overall, with the normal spine curves, the discs in between, are, the pressure is flat on.